a valley divided by the border. On one side, El Paso, and on the other, Ciudad Juarez. El Paso reaps tremendous benefit from the activities going on in Juarez and vice versa. This is the largest border city in the world. El Paso has the lowest crime rate in the United States. Juarez, once known as a booming industrial city and a model of economic progress in Mexico, has become infamous as the murder capital of the world. Since I came here, there was something, something really uh, heavy moving in the city. There was a, a chaotic collapsing of forces. The official story is that the Sinaloa and Juarez cartels are battling for the city and the access it provides to the U.S. drug market only a few hundred meters away. Now there's an estimated 100, 200,000 addicts in the city. That means every street corner is worth killing for, because every street corner is a point of sale now. Every little tienda is a point of sale. More than 8,000 people have been killed here since 2008, the year Mexican President Calderon sent in the army to carry out his offensive against the cartels. 3,951 people were recorded murdered in 2010 alone. We traveled to Juarez to try to understand how human life here came to be worth so much less than the drugs being trafficked through. My question was at the beginning, okay, the whole country was in a fight. Why Juarez has been the bloodiest? There is must be something related just to the story of the city. First game on Wars' newest football field. It's being played to mark a year since 16 people, some of them young members of the home team, were gunned down by a Juarez cartel street gang in this neighborhood of Villa Salvarca. President Calderon provoked the city's anger when he dismissed the massacre as a fight between rival drug gangs. Luz Maria Davila, the mother of two of the young men killed, became the voice of that indignation in pictures that flashed around the world. Today, Mexico's education minister, the governor of Chihuahua, and the mayor of Juarez are here to show they're serious about fighting crime, giving Juarez's teenagers an alternative to gangs and low-level street selling. And though five people have been arrested and charged with the murder of her sons, Marcos and Jose Luis, she has little faith that the government will bring those guilty to justice, even though it's a high-profile case. No, 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 es que en realidad ya, ya con el gobierno no se sabe. Se las ingenian para agarrar inocentes y ya no sabemos si de verdad son los culpables. The Sour Car Massacre undermined the Mexican government's claim that over 90% of the almost 40,000 casualties in Calderon's war on drugs are involved in the narco trade. That those who die are dirty. The fact is, the Mexican government admits only 5% of the murders have ever been investigated. So there's, it is absolutely a lie that 90% are dirty. Nobody knows who they are. But if you go to the morgue, which the Secretary of State Hillary Clinton doesn't do, and which the President of Mexico, Felipe Calderon, doesn't do, which the President of the United States doesn't do, you find on those slabs a bunch of goddamn poor people. More than a decade ago, Author Charles Bowden dubbed Juarez the laboratory of our future. Now that future has arrived, more dystopian than he could have predicted. What I thought was it was going to be an explosion. What I never thought would go from two to 300 murders a year to 3,000 a year. It was beyond my imagination. But the dimension the violence has taken is undeniably real. In Juarez, there's a trail of blood that journalists can follow day by day, hour by hour. It's Saturday morning, and three men have been shot. Two were in a car that is now empty and riddled with bullets. A third, a bystander, was caught in the crossfire and fell here. So there's a body covered by a blanket right there about 50 feet away. This shooting happened about 30 minutes ago, right in the middle of this neighborhood. The amazing thing is, is how little this has really changed life in this neighborhood. I mean, a block down, you have kids playing soccer, you have kids walking around the street here. I mean. 
We're 50 feet from the body and we're the only ones standing here even paying attention to what's going on. Just around the corner, we find Olga Valadez, the mother of 23-year-old Carlos Ivan de Anda. Her son was one of the men in the car. He tried to escape his attackers and ran home. He made it as far as the front step. What would you want the world to know about your son? Later that afternoon, the death toll climbs. On this Saturday, it will reach 16. Three young men have been gunned down at a car dealership. Later, we learned that two are U.S. citizens and have been attending private high schools in El Paso, where their families have moved to safety. So when we got here, this is a really busy road, um, seven, eight lanes across, right through downtown, and uh, traffic was going by. Now they've blocked off all traffic that the road completely blocked, and the media was here. There were local media. Now, now the media are, have all left. The speculation that we see here is that this is an unsafe place to be uh, because it seems like this was a very powerful family that this happened to. Yet another execution. Here, in the middle of a major intersection, a municipal police officer who had just finished his shift is slumped over the wheel of his truck. We watch as the evidence is carefully cataloged and collected. But according to the Mexican government's own figures, 95% of murders presumed to involve organized crime are never investigated at all. Only one to 2% ever result in a sentence. What you're saying when you go to the crime scene is just a charade. The people picking up the bullets, and the cartridges, and measuring everything are actually doing it, but they know absolutely nothing will be done with it. We're not the only ones taking in this grim spectacle. Some observers might be paid by drug gangs to keep watch at the scene of a crime. Others are just watching life unfold and death grip their city, avoiding clear sight of anything that might make them the next target. Here, selective vision is a product of a justice system that seems to operate blindly. The impunity is creating killers, generation of people able, willing to kill. Okay, there is a problem, we can have a solution. But without any investigation, without any clarification of what, what is going on, how can you solve the problem? The lack of a genuine investigation and prosecution frustrates Sandra Rodriguez Nieto, an investigative reporter for El Diario newspaper. She's writing a book about impunity. I mean, the violence in Juarez didn't start uh, three years ago. It started many years ago. It's like our culture, very, very deep in the, in, the, in the city, a culture of violence and impunity. That was the case uh, before the war started. I mean, everybody knew in the city that you can kill and nobody is going to punish you. Sandra has read her share of investigation files from the state prosecutor's office. Many, she says, incomplete, lacking interviews with crime scene witnesses. She says she's been told that under previous governments, the prosecutor's office sent evidence to Chihuahua for archiving, leaving investigators in Juarez with nothing to work from. Well, so the system was designed to not find the murderers? The, yes. To protect the murderers, in a way. I mean, what, what is the other explanation? If you don't ask questions, if you don't ask anybody what they, uh, if you see a car, how many people shoot, I mean, there's no, there is no questions. Against 
To watch more episodes of the Emmy Award winning series Fault Lines, check your local listings or visit aljazeera.com. At least 230,000 people have fled the Juarez area since Calderon launched his war on the cartels in 2006. Like Dr. Sergio and his wife, Guadalupe, more than half have fled to the United States. Dr. Sergio had a successful medical practice. He ran a private clinic, a nursing school, and did charity work. Then, in May of 2009, he was kidnapped. Llegaron cuatro personas con pistolas, eh, puse la pistola en la cabeza cuando cuando iba yo saliendo de mi consultorio y me treparon a un carro. Este, me vendaron, me amarraron las manos y me lleva, me tenían ahí cerca del aeropuerto como me tuvieron, pues cerca de mi consultorio con unas cuadras de ahí. He was released after his family paid a ransom. A year and a half later, extortionists sent him a message, demanding he pay what is known in Juarez as the quota, a fee to protect his clinic. There was no one to call for help. Like most people we spoke to in Juarez, Dr. Sergio doesn't trust the federal police force that is supposed to be protecting him from organized crime. Los, los federales vinieron a ayudarle a los municipales a, a atracar y a secuestrar. Y a toda la gente de Juárez está convencida de eso, porque eh, e incluso gente que ha reconocido a, a, a secuestradores, después los ven que son los federales, entonces se regresan, ya no ponen la denuncia porque ahí son ellos mismos. But unlike Dr. Sergio, most people in Juarez don't have the means to flee to the U.S. Back across the border, Jesus Juarez and his family are packing up too and moving to a different part of town. Rows of homes lie abandoned, stripped by looters. Entire neighborhoods like this one lie empty, vacated by maquila workers like Jesus, many because they've been laid off and can no longer afford to pay the government back mortgages on houses they had been encouraged to buy. For more than 40 years, the city's primary legal economy had revolved around the maquilas, assembly plants which offered foreign manufacturers cheap labor in proximity to U.S. markets. Mexicans moved to the border town lured by the promise of work. The city became the blueprint for the North American Free Trade Agreement implemented in 1994. As NAFTA reshaped Mexico's land ownership laws, slashed tariffs on U.S. imports, and allowed subsidized U.S. corn to flood the country, Mexico's agricultural sector was devastated. Hundreds of thousands were forced to migrate to the United States in search of income. Many more moved to Juarez. The city grew. La promesa del Tratado de Libre Comercio de más, más y mejor trabajo creo que es algo que no se cumplió y no creo que se cumpla. Creo que a partir del Tratado de Libre Comercio todavía se vinieron una serie de, de peticiones al gobierno mexicano de flexibilizar leyes, de flexibilizar la ley del federal del trabajo en prejuicio de los trabajadores. Maria López es a labor organizer. For her security, we can't use her real name or show her face. En un sentido de que se pierde el trabajo de planta, ¿verdad? el derecho al empleo estable se ha perdido a, este, a partir del Tratado de Libre Comercio. To Maria, the fallout from the economic crisis has made NAFTA's false promises clear. In 2008, as U.S. manufacturers faltered or failed, some 80 to 100,000 workers in Juarez lost their jobs. Now many scour their industrial parks for temp contracts meted out by agencies jobs with few benefits and no security, some as short as 15 days. But back across the border, we find a more optimistic outlook. Is if, you're, if you're sending something to your Mexican factory, this is the address you send it to. You don't send it to Mexico. Okay. Alan Russell is the president and co-founder of Tecma. 
an El Paso headquartered company that has provided workers and facilities in Juarez to U.S. manufacturers since 1986. We were NAFTA before there was NAFTA. We were able to move product across the border and uh, have it transformed into a finished product and bring it back again without duty on the material, only paying duty on the value added. So it, uh, it was exactly what NAFTA turned out to be. Russell says the end of the recession in the United States is bringing business back to the Maquila zones in spite of the violence in Juarez. And Tecma is hiring again. Certainly by the end of this year, I think we'll be back equivalent to where we were before the recession started in Mexico. We went into this recession. We now have 8 million square feet of empty manufacturing space right here in Juarez, ready to go. Lights are on. We have 60,000 employees that were laid off during the recession that are ready to go back to work. So if you want your product manufactured, turned quickly, short lead time, you're going to choose Juarez now than, than you would choose China. A recovery means more people will be working, many for minimum wage. 59 pesos, or just under five US dollars a day. The average maquila worker takes home about $50 a week. At Tecma, entry-level workers make slightly more than that. One young woman we spoke to said she made $54, another 58. But more jobs will not change the disparity on which the maquila industry is founded and which has shaped the city. Mira, quien recibe las ganancias de todo el, el trabajo que se realiza aquí en Juárez en la industria, pues solamente son las transnacionales, ¿no? Que ofrece la industria maquiladora. Nunca ha sido suficiente para satisfacer las necesidades básicas de una familia ni de una persona siquiera. These people that came to work in the maquiladoras, they just came to work, but they didn't find houses, they didn't find schools, they didn't find where to take the kids, where they were in the maquiladoras, etc. So there was a social, heavy social problem years ago. Finalmente el narcotráfico viene y ofrece algo que ni el Estado ni, ni el sector industrial ha ofrecido, ¿no? que es decir, mejor salario. And suddenly these people get into a world dynamic and these people just recruit, recruited these, these kids in the streets for $200 and they easily get into the fight. Their parents are go have never gotten ahead. Their parents are slaves. They're working five and a half days a week for low wages. We, these kids join gangs. They join gangs because they're rational. It's better to have some money in your teens and get killed by the age of 20 than be a slave all your life and never have money. Slave labor, without the maquilas, imagine what would be going on in Mexico right now. Without these jobs that are paying these people and providing them, providing them a safe haven and a career path and a goal and a dream, where would Mexico be now? Could a company be competitive in America and pay a good living wage in Mexico to have their stuff assembled? No. No. They would get run over by the competition. Beyond wars of sprawling industrial parks, 25 miles into the desert, lies a shelter. We're heading out to the desert outside of Juarez. Um, going to a mental hospital of sorts, although it's not really a hospital. From what I understand, it, it's just uh, really a, a place in the desert where El Pastor, uh, Pastor Ga uh, Galvin, has, has taken people off of the streets or the police have brought him people that have uh, mental illness or fried from drugs or fried from all the abuse that they've taken in, in Juarez. And he takes them in and they just live out in the desert. Matter of fact, this is it. Fifteen years ago, Pastor Jose Gavon began gathering people he found walking the streets of Juarez and bringing them here. Where he gets the U.S. Army uniform. Well, he liked to be. Yeah. We call him Comandante. Now he looks after more than 100 people. Until now, he's received almost no funding from the Mexican government. 
just barely scraping by each month on private donations to meet their needs. Let me show you the clinic, the little clinic in here. Twice a week, the doctors come in to check out the psychiatric Thursdays and Tuesdays. This is the medication we have, so we need a lot of medication. We got uh, under medication only about 20 persons. The, uh, the rest, 80 persons, we, we can afford it. 25 years ago, Galvin wasn't much different from many of the people he cares for now. A drug addict himself, he was arrested in the U.S., went to jail, and got deported. And then he was dumped in Juarez. And I was walking on the streets like one of them, naked, dirty, eating on the trash cans. But the Lord changed my, my life, and then in 1987, I start a new life. And then I had on my heart to be helping these people. The shelter is the final refuge for those who Mexico's public health care system has failed entirely and left with nowhere else to go. Do you think you'd have these people in any city, or does Juarez have a, a lot of people who need help? Well, yeah. We got some 15,000 persons who are suffering mental illness, plus the violence, the bloody city. We are, Juarez is the biggest mental institution on the world. It's the biggest. And as the drug war escalates, crime spirals, and addictions take their toll, Pastor Gavon's shelter in the desert has grown to accommodate the city's living casualties. It's like a trash, a trash place, but this is a human trash. All the trash people, they came to here because the Lord is a specialist in recycling human beings. See, all the people, I don't care what they did. It's not my concern. Probably they get into drugs, they kill people, they, I don't know what they did, but they lost the mind and they need help. I've been asked to keep my voice down because we are so close to the ISIL position. Who is in charge are they gonna be held to account? Right now we're following the research team into the fire. They are learning how to practice democracy. Just seen tear gas being thrown. Glad it's somebody to hear about us, man. Several human workers were kidnapped. This is what's left of the hospital. It's a crime that's underreported. What do you think killed them? We're making history right now. Al Jazeera America. In Juarez, a life in the factory is worth as little as $50 a week. A life taken on the street is so cheap, it almost never has to be accounted for. But the marijuana, cocaine, meth, and heroin for which thousands are being killed are worth tens of billions on the U.S. market. Their price is inflated because they're illegal. If you want to know one of the biggest causes of death in Mexico is the American drug prohibition. I don't know of any other policy by any other nation on earth that says I'm going to go to Mexico and give 30 to 50 billion dollars a year to absolute psychopathic murderers. That's what U.S. drug policy does. Al-Qaeda couldn't do to war as with the U.S. government stuff. The Obama administration has repeatedly said that legalizing drugs, even some of them, is not an option up for consideration. Over three months in 2011, the State Department, the U.S. Embassy in Mexico City, the U.S. Office of National Drug Control Policy, the DEA, and the Office of the United States Trade Representative all declined to be interviewed for this report. Over those same three months, some 600 people were reported murdered in Juarez. What you're seeing is a drug violence, that's true, but beneath it, you're seeing the disintegration of a nation, the economic disintegration. You're seeing people robbing each other, kidnapping each other, doing everything it takes to survive, including killing each other. We can't face that, many of the U.S. government. We can't say there's an economic basis to this, because that would mean our policy is a myth. Our policy of free trade is a disaster. <laughs> 
That would mean our refusal to recognize why people are coming north is a disaster. That would mean our war on drugs is a disaster. That would mean we'd stop lying. This is like a, a machine now of death, and I don't see anything that'll stop it in the short run.